Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brent Berenson and I'll be the moderator for our presentation. I'm the director of Flora's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovation, innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, our people, are at the core of our success. As with other webinars, this will be a technical presentation. Today's webinar will be about modern modularization. Subject matter experts John Daly and Damian Vucich will discuss what modularization is and what it is not, share some examples from our experience on why and where modularization works, and finally share with you how we implement modularization on our projects at FLOOR. Before we get into the presentation, a couple of housekeeping items. The audio lines for attendees have been muted to eliminate background noise. The session today is being recorded and will be stored in the United States. Please make sure to use the Q&A tab to ask any questions, which should be addressed to all panelists. We welcome questions and we will leave ample time at the end to address any that come through the Q&A. We value your time and the webinar will not extend past the hour allocated. If our experts are not able to answer all questions during the session, a Q&A summary will be sent to all participants within a few days. With us today is John Daly. John is a FLOOR Fellow and Global Technical Director for Modularization based out of the United Kingdom. With more than 25 years of experience in planning and executing modular projects all over the world across all business lines, John is, is, has pioneered several advancements in the fields of modularization. Providing full project lifecycle support to projects, his expertise enables projects to evaluate where, when, and how modularization should be applied to generate improved project performance. Outside of work, John is a dedicated family man, a proud father of three teenage daughters. He enjoys all motorsports and is keen, a keen fan of F1. Also with us today is Damian Vucic. Damian is an SME in the field of modular design and transportation with over 15 years of experience at FLOOR delivering, delivering module, modular projects for many of FLOOR's offices in various regions. Formerly having both a CSA and mining and metals background, Damian now provides project support and guidance from concept through execution from FLOOR's Amsterdam home office. Damien is originally from Australia and is currently living in the Netherlands. In his free time, Damien enjoys running, cycling, and traveling around Europe. Floor has a very strong safety-driven culture, and as such, it's customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. John and Damien, will you please unmute your lines to share a brief safety topic and begin? Hello, everybody. Damien Vizic here. Today, we have selected a short HSE topic that is directly linked to the subject of today's webinar, modularization. Modularization can help de-risk projects by transferring work to a location where fewer variables and unknown elements exist and a more controlled work environment can be created. To demonstrate how modularization can help to de-risk projects, we can compare the conditions that exist on both construction sites and in modularization or fabrication yards. Construction sites are often witness to several areas of risk exposure that can directly impact safety, environmental and productivity performance. These risks include environmental risks, geographical risks and operational risks. The presence and relative strengths of these risks serve as drivers to transfer work off site. We refer to these risks as influencing factors and they help form the business case for modularization. Modularization can target and address these sources of risk by transferring work to a location where their presence and strength is significantly lower. For example, instead of working outside in a changing, challenging and difficult weather conditions, work can be moved indoors where the environment is sheltered and can have improved access. Modularization helps to lower project risk by reducing the number and scale of variables 
and uncertainties that can negatively impact project performance. Thanks, Damien. And hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. In today's presentation, we are going to introduce and discuss a number of key elements associated with modern modularization. And these will include what is modularization, what is a module, why modularize, and how to modularize. Myself and Damien will work our way through these topics and at the end field any questions you may have. We're going to start today by introducing and discussing what modularization is. We've elected to start here because there is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about the term modularization, what modularization is and how it should be applied. Modularization suffers from a number of preconceived ideas, images and perceptions that can limit and hinder its consideration, evaluation and application. At Fluor, we consider modularization to be any program that transfers work off-site in order to gain a strategic advantage. As such, modularization represents a wide range of potential solutions that projects can apply to address issues and lower risk by transferring work to a more controlled location. The level and extent of modularization required will depend upon the needs of the project and the issues and risks that need to be resolved. Many modular projects have experienced failure because a level and extent of modularization required has not been correctly assessed, selected or applied. To address this, modularization must be approached as a process that identifies how and where work can and should be transferred off-site to deliver improved project performance. As a market leader in the field of modularization, Fluor has over 60 years of delivering modular projects all over the world, and we have developed a number of systems, processes, and procedures that help projects successfully deliver modularization programs of all scale and size. Building on what John said, similar to modularization, the term module also suffers a lot from misunderstanding in various industries and around the world. People often associate the term module with very large and complex structures due to its heavy association with the offshore industry and the headline grabbing nature of larger modular projects around the world. Whilst these are great examples of modules, they represent only one area of modularization and the association can often trigger preconceived ideas on the potential complexity, scale and viability of modularization on a project. There are many other types of modules available to help projects address issues and deliver improved performance. A module is simply a product of the modularization process where smaller components and parts are combined to form larger, more complex systems. This can be as simple as a pre-assembled structure or as complex as a facility which has many components of different origins and functions. Modularization considers all options where scope can be transferred off-site to address issues that exist on-site. Anything that moves work away from site to a pre-assembled units is considered part of the modularization process and in itself a module. The degree and extent of modularization to be applied must be carefully evaluated and tested prior to selection and implementation. There are a wide range of modular options available to a project. The degree and extent of modularization applied must be matched to the needs of the project. The range of modular options available to a project include process modules, unit pipe racks, interconnecting pipe racks, pre-assembled structures, vendor package units, vendor assembled units, and various types of prefabrication. Within this slide, you can see many examples of modules which Fleur has fabricated, assembled, and delivered in the past. Furthermore, their associated complexity is graded from left to right with the most intense in terms of vendor supplied items on the left and assemblies of fabricated bulk materials on the right. Above the line also shows examples of modules which have their engineering components mainly from within FLIR engineering departments and below the line are items which may be designed by subcontractors to a project. The range of modular options available to a project are commonly grouped under the banner PPMOD, which stands for Prefabrication, Pre-Assembly, 
project update PPP mode options apply to their project and to what extent in order to define the scale and scope of the modularization program. The modularization program is commonly referred to as the Offsite Manufacturing Program, or OSM for short, to better reflect the range of solution that it covers. The OSM program covers all phases of the module life cycle and is primarily defined by the scale and composition of the modularization scope and the locations where the work is transferred to. These offsite locations include module assembly yards, fabrication yards, vendor facilities, locations which are on site but and the locations which are on site but off plot. Some may be surprised to see site listed as a location for modularization. However, the option to build modules on site but off plot can often be sufficient to successfully address issues faced by a project. The key is to match the module program scope and execution strategy directly to the needs of the project. By generating solutions that reduce risk, modularization can be successfully applied across all market segments and business lines where the right conditions exist. Modularization is helping projects around the world to find more sustainable solutions as well as reducing the time and cost it takes to deliver solutions to the market. This is proving to be particularly successful in the emerging, en emerging energy markets and is helping FLIR to be a true leader in this field. In energy solutions, modularization has a long history of success and is being used extensively in the carbon capture, hydrogen and renewable and sustainable fuel markets to deliver solutions that are driving change. The growth of modularization in this sector is increasing. As site locations grow increasingly remote, the risk, as the risks of working in a brownfield environment are better understood, and the ability to recognize the benefits of modularization continue to improve. The same is true in the urban solutions business line where modularization is proving to be a key strategy in improving efficiencies and helping our clients to meet the growing demand in the sector. In particular, FLIR are actively applying modular solutions in several key markets, including data centers, semiconductor manufacturing facilities, smart battery factories, and environmental other environmental compliance projects. Modularization is also being extensively used in the renewable energy market, both on and offshore, as well as the pharmaceutical industry and several areas within the mining and metals market. Intelligently applied, modularization can offer solutions that improve sustainability, drive down both cost and schedule in almost any situations where the right conditions exist. To be successful, however, the drivers for modularization must exist and the module solution must be matched to best to meet these drivers. Thanks, Damien, on that. But in order to match the modularization program to the needs of the project, it is essential to first understand what the strategic drivers, goals and objectives of the project are. There are many possible drivers, including schedule, in-country value, cost certainty, schedule predictability, sustainability, and cost amongst many others. Once we know what we are trying to achieve, we can then better understand and define what success is and how we can best measure it and target it. With the drivers and objectives identified, we can assess and evaluate any barriers or issues that may prevent a project from being successful. We refer to these barriers and issues as influencing factors, as they have the potential to impact and influence the outcome of a project. A project must identify and evaluate the presence and relative strength of any influencing factors to recognize and understand their potential impact relative to the drivers and goals of the project. Influencing factors can be both project and site specific, and may include labor availability and labor performance issues, site type and attributes, weather and climate impact, logistics and infrastructure constraints, supply chain synergies, design and layout restrictions, geopolitical and sustainability requirements, plus many others. Once the problems have been correctly identified and their potential impact understood, the project can determine what solutions should be applied to best address them. 
Modularization represents one solution amongst many that a project can consider and apply to address these issues, de-risk the project, and provide a platform for improved project success. So, to achieve the maximum impact and generate the greatest value, it is important that the modularization program is directly targeted at the issues that need to be resolved. Failure to target the modularization program will not deliver the desired results of the project. When targeted correctly, modularization can help generate several improvements across multiple areas. These may include reducing the number of people on site, reducing dependencies between tasks and work groups, minimizing the impact on existing operations, increasing productivity and productive time, and minimizing the temporary facilities required on site, such as car parking, storage, and catering, amongst many others. All of these improvements help to de-risk the project and provide greater opportunities to improve project performance. The potential benefits of modularization are perhaps best seen when you compare the productivity and gross added value performance of construction in comparison to the manufacturing industry. As you can see in these graphics, since 1990, the manufacturing industry has seen a significant increase in both productivity and value added, while in construction, it has failed to improve over that same period of time. Modularization helps projects to bridge this gap by transferring scope to locations that feature less variables and are set up to maximize workflow efficiencies. Essentially, modularization takes the work to the workers in locations where greater productivity and efficiency can be achieved. These potential productivity gains can be improved and increased, and time on tools can also be extended and waste reduced when we introduce a program of standardization together with the modularization. So these further performance gains can be achieved with standardization and optimization using targeted programs such as BIM, Lean, and Design for Manufacturing and Assembly. The ability for projects to bridge this gap is often compromised, as modularization is often applied using a more reactive model where options and opportunities are retrospectively evaluated and applied. Increasing the application of modularization is being improved as projects adopt a more proactive approach that enables it to be applied more effectively and much earlier in the project life cycle. The focus is shifting from bespoke project solutions on individual projects to a more standardized portfolio and industry level approach. Industries are moving closer to a product-based execution model that provides greater opportunities to identify and take advantage of the benefits associated with modularization. Increasing the levels of standardization and optimization can therefore be achieved, generating further efficiencies in terms of cost and schedule, and the higher the level of modularization, standard standardization and optimization applied, the closer we can get to achieving the productivity and value added gains that are experienced in the manufacturing industry. This does not mean that a reactive approach does not have its place or it cannot be applied successfully, but the earlier the project considers and integrates modularization into its execution strategy and plans, the better the results will be. Modern modularization is heavily associated with this more proactive approach and is driving step changes in the way that projects are planned and executed. So we're now going to talk about how to modularize. And the previous slides, we discussed what modularization is and what its potential benefits are. And we have described how modularization can represent an opportunity to improve project performance by reducing and better managing risk. However, many modular projects fail to recognize this opportunity and do not deliver or experience the results expected or required. There are many reasons for this failure, but the most common cause is that modularization is not considered or applied early enough in the project life cycle for it to be effectively implemented. To address this problem, projects must improve their ability to identify and evaluate risks and opportunities earlier in the project life cycle. This will enable them to identify if, where, and how modularization could be applied more effectively 
and provide sufficient time for the project to take advantage of the opportunities that are available. The cost and effort to implement ideas and make changes increases the later in the project that they are introduced. This can significantly reduce the potential value of an opportunity as the effort and cost to deliver it begin to outweigh the value that it can generate. To maximize the potential value of an opportunity and the ease with which it can be achieved, projects must find ways to make key strategic decisions earlier in the project lifecycle and implement an accelerated design effort. Introducing something as significant as modularization too late in this program is a recipe for disaster, but it is a mistake that projects continue to make. For example, modularization commonly suffers from an association with large and complex modules, as these are the forms of modularization that grab the headlines. Additionally, when people say the word module, or modularization, the first thing they may think of is very large, complex modules or offshore top sides. And that's not exclusively the case. And as we said earlier, modularization re represents a full range of solutions. So that stigmatism that's associated with the term modularization is a barrier that needs to be broken in the industry. Modularization is also confused and sometimes labeled as fabrication. Fabrication is actually part of modularization along with the design, procurement, logistics, and construction phases of the module lifecycle. The third point here builds upon what we have previously presented. Modularization is often introduced and included too late. It is very common that modularization is looked at, for example, very late in feed or in detail design, which is too late for a project to recognize its benefits. It requires too much rework, so the cost to implement modularization outweighs the benefits that it can bring so, therefore, it's essential that projects need to look at ways of making the decision on modularization much earlier for it to be rolled out and implemented successfully. A key reason for this delay is that modularization is often seen as a patch or an add on to conventional and traditional stick build execution models. Projects will be started up and will roll out the same conventional organization and then make the decision to go modular and try to apply it on top of the existing traditional stick built instead of actually setting the project out correctly from day one. Execution that is focused and targeted around modularization needs to be integral and central to the project execution strategy rather than applied as a patch on the side. A modular project requires a fully integrated project delivery approach because the relationships and dependencies that exist across the module lifecycle cannot be addressed in isolation. Projects that follow a traditional uh, EPC construction model that starts with design moves to procurement and then engages with construction and fabrication often fail. This is because by the time the feedback and input from construction and fabrication is received, it's often too late to efficiently and effectively implement the required changes. This rework directly leads to delays in schedules and increasing costs. The issues associated with this are often compounded when projects apply a conventional left to right planning model where activities are sequentially driven using a finish start relationship between tasks. This does not effectively support modular programs, which are better served using a right left execution analysis that starts with the end game and works backwards from there to more accurately determine key events deliverables and relationships that need to be scheduled in order to deliver a successful project. To address these issues, projects must be planned and executed using a more proactive and integrated approach. It's therefore clear that projects must evaluate their execution strategies as early as possible to enable the benefits of modularization to be fully recognized. Modularization should be introduced and considered no later than feed and preferably well before then. Projects that delay the consideration of modularization until after feed will experience significantly more challenges with less potential benefits. The challenge, however, is how do you introduce modularization effectively earlier in the project lifecycle when information is potentially limited while still driving value to the project? People 
and projects naturally want to defer making decisions until they have as much information as possible. However, waiting to get that level of data often results in the value of the opportunity being diminished. This is commonly referred to the, as the decision-making paradox and can often paralyze a project's ability to make key strategic decisions during the early phases of the project lifecycle. Flow, however, have developed a strategic evaluation process that uses our extensive modularization history, experience, and data to help resolve the issue and provide projects with the opportunity to introduce modularization earlier and deliver improved results. Thanks, Damien. And this process is a data driven and uses decision quality and critical thinking to help projects evaluate how, where, and when modularization can be applied, specifically to help reduce risk and deliver improved project performance using a systematic, neutral, transparent, and most importantly, auditable manner. It enables projects to target and evaluate solutions more effectively by focusing on and targeting the issues, barriers, and risks that need to be resolved. Fluid system enables projects to identify and select the right strategy at the earliest opportunity to help accelerate and compress the design process and development of the essential project execution plans. The Fluid strategic evaluation system consists of five phases that have been targeted to help projects understand what they are trying to achieve, what are our drivers, why are we doing this, and how do we define success, recognize and evaluate what barriers and issues exist, and better understand how they could prevent us from being successful, identify what options and solutions are available to the project in terms of both modular and non-modular solutions, and then test, validate, and compare these options and verify their ability to support the goals and objectives of the project. And then finally, it helps you to select the best package of options available to the project and provide projects with a clear pathway to success. This process enables the goals and barriers associated with a project to be correctly identified and evaluated and then used to develop the right package of solutions. As a result of this process, projects can confirm what scope should be transferred off-site, what form of modularization should be applied, and what the optimum execution strategy for the project will be. Confirmation of the optimum execution strategy enables the project to then define and frame, as well as develop, key execution plan elements. In particular, the system enables projects to identify and frame the organizational requirements for all phases of the project, provides key layout and basis of design inputs to help accelerate and focus the engineering program more effectively. It improves targeting and locking down of sourcing and contracting strategies. It helps us to identify fabrication requirements, options, and strategies. It helps us to improve consideration and integration of logistics requirements limitations and solutions, and it also helps us to support and promote a more construction-driven execution approach, all of these helping to drive down both costs and schedule. The system developed by Flua enables this to be completed earlier and more effectively on projects. Completing this process earlier enables projects to accelerate and better frame all subsequent phases of the project, essentially addressing the decision-making paradox we previously discussed and helping to reduce overall project durations of cost. So when we talk about modularization, it's important to recognize that it is not possible to transfer 100% of the work off-site. There will always be a non-transferable amount of scope, for example, in terms of site preparation and module integration post-setting. The key is to identify what represents the optimum extent of modularization to deliver success. The value and benefits of applying different levels of modularization need to be taken into consideration to find the right solution. Value and benefit must be measured against the project driver's goals and objectives. Projects often make the mistake of focusing on cost only, but this is only one potential driver and measurement of success. The objective must be to identify the maximum level of modularization possible 
but to also select the optimum amount that generates the best results. Increasing or decreasing the level of modularization may deliver improved results, but finding the optimum solution will generate the best results. The process and system developed by Fluor enables projects to achieve this and it's vital that it is applied as early in the project as possible to generate the maximum value and impact. Ideally, projects will have evaluated and made their decision on modularization prior to the start of feed. The extent and of modularization and its associated modularization execution strategy will directly impact and influence the basis of design for the project and the execution plans for engineering, supply chain and construction. To enable projects to evaluate modularization earlier and more effectively, FLUR have developed a comprehensive strategic evaluation process that can be applied as early as FEL0 to help identify and select the optimum execution strategy and extent of modularization required. What we can see on screen here is a typical modularization execution strategy with key modular activities mentioned, starting at pre-feed, where we define the optimum modular strategy and scope for the project. During feed, shown in the blue, projects establish the basis of design and engage with key contractors to further define the work and minimize the risk. During EPC prep and the construction phase, Awarding of key contracts allow for the start of fabrication, the transportation of modules, and then eventually receiving them on site. When planning and executing a modular program, it's essential that the basis of design, the execution strategies, and plans for all groups involved in the project are fully integrated and based upon the mod module life cycle. The module life cycle consists of seven key phases. They are planning and execution, planning and organization. What does the project, what does project management need to organize and execute the work? Engineering design and layout. What are we building and what does it look like? Procurement, supply chain. What are, what are we buying and where is it coming from? Fabrication and assembly. Where, how and who is going to build and assemble it? Shipping and transportation. How do we move the items to site? Installation, hookup and testing. How are we going to install it and in what sequence? And lastly, operations and maintenance. These phases are interrelated and the relationships, dependencies and impact of each phase must be considered independently and approach using an integrated solutions based approach. These are used to structure the evaluation and execution process for modular projects and have been used as the basis for the project modularization study structure. Each phase must be evaluated both in its own right and as part of the overall project. Decisions and actions in one area will have a direct and indirect impact on one or more of the other phases. Failure to recognize and address this is a major cause of failure on module projects. However, FLIR utilizes an integrated solutions approach to ensure that the optimum solution for each project is identified and executed. In particular, it's important to recognize that decisions and actions in one area will have a direct or indirect um, impact on one or more of the others. Failure to recognize these relationships and address them is a major cause of failure on module projects. Blur utilizes a fully integrated solutions approach based on an integrated project delivery model to address this on our modular projects. It is important to recognize that every project will have its own unique features and challenges that must be taken into consideration. The strengths and weaknesses of all the options available should be considered in their own right and as part of the overall project execution plan. 
projects must perform a value trade of assessment to recognize cost and effort to deliver, as well as the potential value when making key decisions. In certain situations, it may be necessary for certain groups to make compromises or adjustments in order to deliver the best overall result for the project. Decisions made in isolation can be extremely damaging and must be avoided at all costs. Modularization involves and impacts all groups involved in a project, and as such, early introduction of modularization and the use of a fully integrated execution model are considered essential for success. We'll now bring today's presentation to a close by reiterating some of the key messages that we've covered today. Modularization must be seen as a process that enables projects to identify where and how to transfer work offsite to deliver improved project performance. Modularization represents a range of solutions that can help mitigate risk and generate opportunities to improve productivity. Modularization must be targeted. Modularization is not the answer to every problem, and it is important to apply modularization only where it adds value and lowers overall project risk. Modularization must be evaluated and integrated at the earliest possible opportunity to provide sufficient time to fully recognize the benefits that it can offer. Modularization requires a fully integrated approach to planning and execution, and it must address all phases of the module life cycle to deliver the best results. Modularization does not come for free. All costs, benefits, and impacts associated with modularization must be taken into consideration to determine its true value. When the cost and effort to implement modularization outweigh the benefits that it brings, projects should look at alternative solutions. And finally, projects need to move into a more proactive execution model to generate the best results and maximize the potential benefits that modularization can deliver. And that concludes our high level presentation on modern modularization. We thank you for your time and we will now hand you back to Brent. Thank you, Damien and John. Let's take a moment to address the questions that have come through the chat thus far. And again, as a reminder, please use the Q and A function in WebEx and make sure that you address your questions to all panelists. Uh, the first question, um, this is for John, referring to slide 21, what challenges do you see in the implementation of the ideal modularization process within your projects in our, within our stubborn industry? Do the owners recognize and acknowledge that more time may be needed to properly plan a module project? Okay, that's a good question. And it shouldn't be targeted just at owners and clients. It's across the board as an industry issue that when we look at how to successfully apply modularization, Damien gave a lot of great information around why modular projects have consistently failed in the past. And it's that early introduction and it's its full integration, which is the key. Many projects will select a conventional execution model and then consider modularization too late. The barrier to bringing that earlier into the process is having a tool and a system that enables clients to do that with a high enough degree of confidence to make strategic decisions earlier in the project lifecycle. And that's what Fluor have developed over the last few years together with a number of clients across key markets is this tool and system that enables our clients now to evaluate modularization more effectively earlier to make these key decisions and start to make this change. So breaking that decision-making paradox that Damien referred to is essential for projects moving forward and as an industry as a whole to delivering modularization most effectively. All right, thank you, John. And, and actually as a follow-up to that question on, again, on slide 21, um, does supply chain, do, do supply chain professionals within your organization understand that Standardization sometimes means making commercial commitments early and perhaps selecting equipment and material that is not at the lowest cost. Yeah, and that's again, it comes back to that fully integrated approach we talk about. It's 
from your design and your supply chain need to be fully aligned. So when your engineers are selecting the materials, that has to be closely linked to your procurement and contracting strategies. So the selection of materials and where you're going to source them need to be executed in parallel together so that you get the best results. And enabling different groups to recognize that they may need to make a compromise in a certain area to deliver best overall value to a project. So often you find, as, you know, again, going back to Damien with the executing projects in silos, when that occurs, people don't realize that where they feel they're generating value, they're actually contributing to lower overall project performance. So in engineering, it's most commonly seen, say, with structural engineering, where we will refine the design and save 5% of the structural steel, but it took us three months to get there, and the cost savings associated with that 5% are actually less than the value of the materials we've saved and the impact on schedule we've had. So the challenge is across all EPC stakeholders and groups, and to ensure that everybody is working together and understands that we're working collectively towards a common goal and how our individual contributions apply and how we can influence and impact the success of a project. All right, thank you. Um, this one also is for John. Um, referring to slide 16, you mentioned that energy transition technologies such as green or blue hydrogen, carbon capture, energy storage, et cetera, um, would be benefiting from modularization solutions to improve efficiency and time to market. What is Floor doing in this arena? Yeah, that's a great question. And the emergence and growth of the energy transition market is forcing a lot of people to change the way that they approach projects. Technical innovation and technology is vitally important, but the ability to deliver projects at a reduced time and cost to market is proving to be a stronger driver than actually the technology itself. So coming up with solutions that clients can almost pull off the shelf. So a design one, build many type approach is seen as being a key in the emerging energies market to deliver for a vast majority of the smaller projects that you're going to see. There are a number of different types of projects across the emerging, sorry, the energy transition market. The larger bespoke projects would also benefit from a higher degree of standardization, because if we can get them to even 30, 40 percent standardized and consistent design approach, we will then reduce the engineering effort and cost to actually deliver those projects. But where we see it most effectively is in the smaller projects where off the shelf design won't build many solutions. Uh, will be able to be applied across multiple sites and business lines in the market. So we're actively working in all key energy markets um, from the fabrication of offshore jackets and platforms for the, the wind industry through to turnkey solution and carbon capture and the hydrogen markets. So we and the last thing I'll say here is that we're very fortunate at Fluid that we have a very strong technology group and that we have a lot of you know, market leading technologies in these energy transition markets. So what we're doing now is finding ways to deliver those solutions to market faster and cheaper. All right, thank you, John, that's great. Um, question for Damien, referring to slide 15, are there considerations which make modularization more or less attractive for certain business lines within Floor? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, yes, there is. Um, there's a variety of uh, considerations come attributes that uh, exist for the different business lines that um, that could certainly lead them uh, to consider modularization as a good execution solution. So things like location is awfully important. So things that are commonly in the energy solution markets, maybe in uh, port facilities, where existing infrastructure already is um, available, i.e. Uh, access to water, um, cranes, et cetera. Uh, that can help you in some uh, respects, but also location can be different in other respects. For example, in more mining um, projects where locations are remote, thinking of places like uh, deserts in Australia or places at elevation in South America, um, they may uh, also, uh, have considerations which will move those uh, decisions either left or right. Other considerations include things like uh, 
IP, for example, intellectual property. There are solutions that potentially they don't want you. There are projects that would not want to send their products to a uh, to location yard to modularization yards. Also, there are situations where IP where it needs to be protected and it can be protected in one yard rather than be exposed uh, to um, to uh, you would be fraught with danger where it was exposed to other other subcontractors. This also goes for vendor supplied items uh, situations which are often like pipe racks or conveyors, which are the assembly of a lot of bulk materials, may lend themselves in certain situations to modularization. Also, if the vendor uh, supplied items, say for example here in Europe, where the uh, vendor supplied items must be CE marked and CE stamped, if they are located next to the module yard, they can provide great benefits as well. And the last one that sort of comes to mind there is that um, it's sort of a greenfields versus brownfield situation. So a lot of markets, um, and business lines, for example, uh, in a brownfield situation, it may assist and may be a, a large consideration. Why? Well, there might be shutdown periods where you may only have access to a particular side of a facility for a certain number of days. And therefore, a module would be a, would be a great assist to be able to install that uh, quickly and get the facility up and running. Whereas in a greenfield project, you may be able to have a module program which may be, you know, something from 20 modules to 100 modules to, to more um, in a sequence, that might be something that would be a worthwhile consideration for that uh, business line as well. So it all really depends on things like location, then the location of vendor, supplied items, IP and greenfields, uh, brownfield sort of solutions. All right, thanks, Damien. Uh, the next question is for John. In my experience, modularization actually will extend the overall project schedule. What's Fleur's experience? Yeah, that's one of the common misconceptions labeled at modularization as a generalization, you would say. Um, what happens often is that projects will compare a perfect stick built schedule against a modular schedule and say that modularization is taking longer. As we've explained in today's presentation, we're looking to apply modularization to address issues that risk project performance. So when we build up the schedule for a stick build program, these risks must be taken into account. And if they're extending the program, we will often find that when modularization is applied to address those issues, it can actually resolve that schedule impact. So it's very much dependent on the application of modularization, the size of the project and the scale of the project. The other thing is you have to understand that in some projects, the drivers for modularization are extremely strong. The option to stick build is either not there or it will perform so badly that the modular approach is the only solution available to it. So you're looking at projects in like the oil sands of Canada in Kazakhstan where we have extreme temperature ranges and labor restrictions and issues. So to say that modularization takes longer is a generalism, um, which is slightly unfair because modularization when targeted correctly will actually lead to improved schedule performance. Uh, what is a major schedule impact of going modular is that you need to front end load your engineering and procurement programs. So a lot of projects prefer to have a leveled engineering and a leveled uh, procurement program with those historical left to right transfers and uh, relationships. What modularization does is it means that you've got to do more earlier to deliver the modular program effectively. So that's a scheduled challenge with modularization, but in essence, modularization itself can often uh, reduce project schedules and sometimes the schedule overruns that modularization represent are outweighed by the other benefits it brings. So if a project um, is trying to reduce the number of labor on site, but modularization will increase the program by two months, the project may put a priority on keeping the number of people on site down. So it's a premium they're willing to pay. All right, thanks, thanks for that, John. Um, Next question also goes to you. Uh, is Floor able to help our company determine whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not modularization makes sense for an upcoming project, even if Floor is not involved directly with the design or construction? We are self performing the engineering and construction. 
Yes, there, the systems and tools that we've touched upon in today's presentation can be applied to all project execution models. And as we've repeated on a number of occasions, the earlier that this is taken into consideration, the better it will be. And we've been working with our clients to provide this early concept development and feasibility studies for our clients um, across the world and across all business lines to help them approach and pass through their key strategic gateways. So when they're looking for these approval gateways and they have to get through, we've been working very closely with a number of clients now to provide them the information they need to get through these gateways more efficiently and more effectively. But we are working as a, an organization to get engaged as early as possible and to help our clients to come up with the best solution that results in fluor responsible for the final engineering procurement and construction is a, a byproduct of that process but essentially we want to get in as early as we can to help our clients understand where modernization could be best applied so we are not restricted to apply modernization in a full epc we have been actively working essentially in the role of a consultant early in the project life cycle to help clients understand what represents the right solution for them. Great, thank you, John. Um, next question is for Damien. Is the advanced work package framework compatible with modularization? Absolutely, it's integral to its success. Both go hand in hand. Um, and key key to to those sort of things is working early with both uh, the construction and engineering teams to set those packages up for successful implementation. When successfully uh, implemented, it makes it very very easy through any stage of the cycle to be able to identify what piece of bulk material and or vendor item is coming to or from the module yard or in fact may not even go to the module yard. There might be certain reasons that a, a piece may not go to the module yard and can easily be identified by the proper use of AWP so that once it arrives at site, it will be identified as right. It is allocated to that module but needs to be installed um, afterwards. There's there's many examples where that, that uh, might be applicable from things that are too fragile or may have long lead items or values IP, et cetera, like I talked about before. So uh, those sort of um, advanced work packaging uh, items are key. Plus, once you actually go to the module yard, it enables for seamless transition and seamless movement of uh, free issued items or um, purchased bulk materials by the subcontractors to be identified and assembled in the correct fashion. It also is key for um, material allocation. A lot of uh, yards may have, you may not be the only project in that yard. So that's also key. Uh, also to understand sequencing, it helps in, in that um, uh, realm as well. And for um, charge codes and billing later on for invoicing. All these things are key so that they can be assessed uh, properly and allocated correctly and the overall project is a success. The end result for us is obviously a module which arrives on site and is installed um, with, uh, with very little work to be added so that we can achieve our scheduled um, and uh, commercial performances on projects. So uh, adv advanced work packaging is definitely compatible and is in fact, um, uh, is it advantageous and is integral to successful uh, module uh, execution strategies. All right, thanks, Damien. Uh, next question is for John. Referring to slide 28, how are the cost and schedule benefits of modularization versus stick built accurately quantified during pre feed? Yeah, this is a, a key element to this, and this is why this process is essentially, you know, focused on a data driven uh, system. Uh, when we're looking at the costs and schedules at this early stage of a project, it's important that we can refer to and rely to the Fluor Historical Data Center, which carries a lot of information about previously executed projects and provides us the ability to benchmark projects against those that have gone before, so we get a good indication of what the indicative performance of these projects will be. The system itself as well, as we go through, we can very accurately review and evaluate the scope of modularization on a project 
and we have a number of systems that help us there to establish what the OSM scope would be. So number of modules, composition of the module program, and their various tonnages and complexities. From there, we can accurately, again, evaluate what the cost associated with that type of modular project will be. And we can then look at the range and extent of modularization to be applied, and then look at the execution options. So would a you know, modular program on site, but off plot, represent better value than a program where you would build it in Asia and ship it halfway around the world to site. So we have a lot of that historical information and data available to us. We also have very strong links and relationships um, across you know, all phases of the module lifecycle with various contractors and suppliers where we can access them to get live and up-to-date data on where the market is and where the market is heading. Um, there are a lot of issues um, regarding things like the availability of large ships and the bunker cost, the fuel for shipping. And it's good to keep abreast of that because a lot of the time we're looking at projects which are, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line. And speculating and forecasting where costs will be is critical to understanding how the relative performance will work. So this process that's on this slide is designed to help us do this in a transparent and auditable fashion. And then if any of the variables do change, we can go back, recycle this process and retest it to see if the solutions and the results are the same if part of the input data has changed. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question, I think. Um, and this is a follow up to the question you just answered, John. Uh, referring to slide 31, is the level of engineering involvement during the RFP process adequate in order to incorporate modularization strategies? Yeah, ideally, you know, we go back and we've reiterated a lot. The integrated solutions approach is critical. Um, engineering must be involved from the very start of this process. So they need to be able to understand what inputs they need to provide into the evaluation and what the results of the evaluation process mean for engineering. So it's vitally important that engineering are part of this so that they can target the engineering program and the basis of design for the project to directly target the issues of modularization are trying to fix. Uh, for example, if we're trying to reduce the number of people on site, if we transfer only you know low density, low effort hour associated scope, we're not going to have the impact that we're trying to achieve. So it may look volumetrically that we're transferring a lot of the work off site, but we're not targeting and addressing the problem, which is we've got to reduce the number of people on site. But by making these decisions, it's essential that engineering are there for the full journey to provide their input to let us know when and where it's practical to do so. So we, we do a lot of work around the, the technical feasibility and the commercial viability and engineering is a key player in that. And as we go through this process, understanding you know, what role engineering play throughout the module life cycle is essential. And if ultimately, when we take the modules out into the yard, the level of engineering management that will transfer out to the yard with the rest of the yard management team. All right, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, and appreciate all the great questions from the audience. Um, Looks like that, that's all the time we have left for questions. I want to thank you, Damien and John, for that interesting discussion. And thanks to our audience. We appreciate your attending and for your engagement today. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. We'll be hosting our next webinar on November 17th at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time to discuss advanced process modeling. Floor Senior Fellow Paul Mathias and Floor Fellow Samantha Nicholson will discuss case studies to highlight the many ways in which process design relies on physical properties. Please continue to stay informed of these events by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or following our social media channels using hashtag Innovation Builders. If you'd like us to send you email notification of future webinars, please email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in today. We'll send out a compiled list of the Q and A's within a few days, along with the notification that the webinar recording is available for replay on floor.com. 
If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Mm -hmm.